Well, fantastic, as I always say. Uh, today we have on That's Classic a gentleman that uh, definitely will be uh, able to give us a lot of background on the Dick Van Dyke Show. Uh, he uh, was the founder and the publisher of the Walnut Times, which is the Dick Van Dyke newsletter. And he also uh, put out the 60th anniversary uh, special of the Dick Van Dyke Show. And um, and by the way, in both of these cases, they were uh, backed or authorized by, uh, you know, uh, the Carl Reiner family, Dick Van Dyke. Uh, has had a lot of backing. So anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, David Van Dusen. David, thanks for being here. Thank you, John. It's great to be here and share my passion about the Dick Van Dyke Show. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I think any fans out there of the show, believe me, you're going to love this. There's a lot of information here. Um, right, right out of the gates, uh, David, I wanted to ask you, in relation to Dick Van Dyke, where was he at really in his career you know, at the time that uh, they were looking for, like, you know, who they were going to cast in this show. Dick was sort of struggling in the entertainment career. He had bounced around a little bit. He had done uh, some traveling nightclub shows, and he had landed a contract with CBS, and that didn't really work too well. It, tur it turned out, uh, you know, he actually, Walter Cronkite was his his newsman during Dick's run of the CBS morning show. Wow. Uh, but... Um, he was just going around auditioning and he finally landed Bye Bye Birdie um, and was doing well in, in Bye Bye Birdie. And that's when the opportunity presented itself um, as they were looking to cast the Dick Van Dyke show. Sheldon Leonard and Carl Reiner went to New York and, and found Dick there and said that that's that's our guy for the show. So so they saw him in Bye Bye Birdie and that's how they, did. they realized this is the guy. Right. I'll be darn. Now, on the when you mentioned Walter Cronkite, by the way, was he on the morning show? Uh, he, yeah, Dick and Dick and he were sort of like the the hosts, or you know, Cronkite did the news on the morning show. So they had very early connections way back in the in the mid fifties. I'll be darned. I have to admit, I did not know that. That that's that's quite interesting. So then they, you know, they're going through the casting process and they're trying to find obviously uh, the role for Laura Petrie. What, uh, how did that come about that Mary Tyler Moore enters this? And a lot of this is in your documentary, but I'm always intrigued to hear like, you know, what did, what did you find out? Yeah, well, well Mary was probably the last one cast uh, of the group. Uh, Dick, Dick was first and Rose Marie was second at the recommendation of Sheldon Leonard. Rose Marie said, well, who do you have for the other writer in, in, the, in the office? They said, we don't know. And she said, what about Maury Amsterdam? So Carl said, oh, I was thinking of somebody different, but that may work. So down they went and they really struggled trying to cast the role of, of Laura. Um, interestingly, Danny Thomas said amongst the discussions, who was that girl, young girl that tried out for my show, but we didn't use her because I said they would, no one would ever believe she would be my daughter because her nose was too cute. Nothing like mine. Danny Thomas's big, big nose, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the girl with the three names. So they ended up uh, asking Mary to come in. And, and Mary also almost didn't go to the interview because she'd been being turned down and she didn't want to go in and get turned down again. But she went in and started to read with Carl. And Carl describes it as there was this ping in her voice. And he said, I, I knew it. He said, I grabbed her by the head and down the hall, we went to Sheldon Leonard's office uh, on the Desi Luca hang a lot. And he said, I, I found our Laura. And, and, and that was it. Um, the only the only concerns uh, raised um, was Dick, you know, was in his mid 30s. And he said, gosh, are, are people going to believe that she and I could actually be husband and wife? Because there was quite an age disparity between the two of them, almost 13 or 14 years. between." I the had two no of them. idea. Yes. Yeah. Dick was in his mid thirties and and uh, or early thirties anyway, um, and uh, Mary was in her early twenties. But yeah, as as you look back now, very believable couple for sure. Now, so had Mary done much herself then? She had done. Um, she was probably most well known for. Um, she did, had done happy hot point commercials. Yep. Um, and. She was the voice of the secretary on uh, Richard Diamond, Private Eye. Wow. But you never saw her. You just saw her legs and her sort of sultry, sultry voice. 
So she she really, you know, her husband, uh, Robert Levine, said Mary really wanted to be a dancer, you know, and a mm-hmm. Broadway performer, sort of that well-rounded package. Um, and in the end, this this role came to her and she just exploded in terms of, of talent, right? She was mm-hmm. very, very new, but Dick would say how quickly she learned. And of course, uh, what an environment to learn in between Dick Van Dyke and Rose Marie and Maury Amsterdam veterans of vaudeville. And, you know, so what, what a, what a training ground to, in, in real life to help, help hone her comedy timing. And they quickly realized that, you know, she had that timing um, to, to begin to use her more. Yeah, she was just a natural. Yeah, it's funny. You know, we talked about uh, Rosemary and Maury Amsterdam. It, when you say like they had the the background, I mean, Rosemary goes back to Baby Rose, Correct. which is, is crazy in itself. I mean, by the time she got Dick Van Dyke, my gosh, she had a career that most people would have given their right arm for. You're, and you're then, absolutely right. Yeah. And then Maury, Maury, I mean, he is like the vaudeville guy. I mean, it's like it's a it's amazing. Um that they they were able to bring this cast together and then in that setting like you know when you say that mary was able to learn my gosh that's like uh you know a gift from god at that point you know yeah i mean the cast it, as you look back now uh, i i would suggest that it probably was one was one if not the finest cast ensemble a- ever put together you know mm-hmm. the, the fact that you know carl's intention was to not just show the not not just to pick the husband of Hi Honey I'm Home, but you got to go to his office and see what he did for a living and see what his coworkers were like, um, and and you know Buddy and Rob and Sally all have this camaraderie, um, you know, and Buddy feverishly picked on Mel, you know, the yeah. the boss's brother-in-law, but then we went home and, and saw the home life um, and got to see home situations that we could all relate to, and then occasionally you know the the worlds collided and. and the cast would be visiting Dick at home or Mary would stop into the office. So mm-hmm. um, sort of a very unique look. And I would say attributable to the brilliance of, of Carl Reiner's thoughts and, and writing. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. I, I watched your documentary by the way, and I, I thought you did a fantastic job. I think you, you Thank brought, you. you broke it down so well between the actors, the writers you know the legacy of the show, the all the way through the memorabilia, all of this. It was uh, it was a great breakdown. I mean, trust me, I'm not just pushing David's documentary here. If you watch it and you're a Dick Van Dyke fan, you can't help but enjoy it. But the um, the one thing that I was going to ask uh, too is I noticed that in watching the documentary that a lot of the um, show premises came from real life. I mean, like I I, I believe even in the documentary you mentioned or somebody says that we would sit down and the writers would all be like, so uh, how'd your day go? Like almost yeah. like we got to come up with something and we're going to figure out who had the, had something happen to him. Yeah. I, I think that was Carl's, Carl's idea because it was something that he felt people could relate to. And as funny as situations were on the Dick Van Dyke show, I, I just r- would like to reemphasize that they were the situations, right? There's not a lot of, joke telling in the dick van dyke show Mm -hmm. there's a little banter buddy will tell a joke in the office as part of the scene or as part of the storyline right but um bill persky one of the writers said you know it was the situations that were funny we -hmm. would put the actors in a scenario and let them just excel and and expound on on what was there he said many times you know we'd say you know dick is so and so and and he's gonna do this and that would be that would be what was written in the script and they would hand that to dick and Dick would be given the the opportunity to be creative and play it how we wanted and and rehearse and do physical bits and all those sorts of things, right? So I just think the entire environment was such a creative atmosphere for everyone. You know, they would sit around and do table reads um, and the cast members would feel free to throw in ideas. No one, everyone was encouraged to and no one was ever shut down. And that included guest stars who appeared on the show. Wow. Um, the, the guest stars said the Van Dyke set was a very different set than all the other shows that they did because of the warming, inviting atmosphere that, that was there. They were asked to contribute. Many of their ideas ended up in the shows that, that they were part of, right? And they were made to feel part of that Van Dyke show family while they were there that week shooting their, their episode. So wow. that, to me, is, is a great tip of the hat to 
the environment that Carl and Dick, you know, the tone that they set on on the set um, to to foster that creativity um, as they as episodes evolve from the initial drafts to the to the final performance. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You don't hear that about any other show. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people and nobody nobody ever says that. In fact, we've kind of gone backwards actually in in the way it's done now. It's like you're you're barely if you're the guest star, you're barely recognized and you're barely welcomed in. So that's that's really interesting. Um the uh the other thing, oh, let me just say this the, the other thing that I think is interesting, John, is you know, they really shot the show like a play, right? From beginning to end. Dick always said that he needed the audience to 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 have their reactions to help him understand what was funny and what moves to make. Um, and back in those days, um, they did the Dick Van Dyke show one time through, and then maybe they did, um, you know, post post production shots of camera angles or something. But you know, in more modern times, to shoot a sitcom, usually there's two two airings and two different audiences, and That's it correct. could go on for several hours. They would go in at seven o'clock and they would be done by nine and they were done in two hours, right? So I think that's also like, they were a bit of a machine in terms of, you know, hitting their marks and the directors and their lines and the cameras and all the, the music cues and things. Um, just a very well-oiled machine back then. Wow, that says a lot. That says a lot. Believe me, I've, I've been in the business for quite a while. I've been on quite a few sets and that does, that does not happen. That's for sure, just like you said. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of it is you've got Danny Thomas in the background of this and you've got Sheldon Leonard. So did Danny, the origins of this, did, I, I'm trying to remember, did Sheldon Leonard go to Danny Thomas? The idea did, or, I mean, how did, how did that evolve that we've got Danny Thomas, Sheldon Leonard and Carl Reiner together? So, so Carl had originally written a pilot called Head of the Family. Mm -hmm. um, fans, fans may appreciate the fact that Carl's original um, pilot aired on July 19th, 1960. I always say it's a bit of karma because David Van Dusen was born on July 20th, 1960. So oh, I think that nice. was the fusing of our of, of my passion for the show. Um, but the, the show aired um, and it really didn't do well. Um, and Carl had actually, over the summer months, gone and written 10, 11, 12, 13 different episodes hmm. because his idea was if the show took off, he sort of wanted the characters well-established for other writers to be able to read about how they how they should react with each other and, and the like. Um, so it failed and it, and it sat for the longest time. And Carl's uh, was involved with the William Morris Agency at the time where Sheldon Leonard was. And somehow they got connected and Sheldon said, you know, let me, would you send me the show? Let me look at it. And Carl said, well, I, I don't want to fail with the same material twice. And Sheldon said, no, let, let me take a look. And after he looked at it, he said, well, he said, the material is good, but you were miscast for the role. So Carl said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you should be the producer. And Carl said, well, I, I don't know how to be the producer. And he said, oh yes, you do. I could tell by your your little writings inside your script. This angle, turn here, do this, do that. So Sheldon, you know, Carl, Carl famously would imitate Sheldon, and I'll do my bad impression. But Sheldon would say, "We'll get a better actor to play you," right? And that's that's how they began their search, and and ultimately ended up with Dick Van Dyke. Wow. In terms of in terms of Danny's involvement, you know, Sheldon and Danny had been partners for many years at that point, doing. The Danny Thomas show and 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 many others. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I think Danny's primary role was to help provide some of the financing to get the show off the ground. Yeah, I was thinking uh, that. And you know, Danny back in the day was um, very very uh, had done very well and really had quite quite a machine in ter in terms of having um, money to to finance projects. You know, like this one. So so in the end, Carl. And Sheldon and Danny and Dick formed their own production company, which fans know as Calvada Productions, always in the ending credits. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was an amalgam of their four names. So CA was for Carl, L was for Leonard, VA for Van Dyke, and DA for Danny Thomas. Um, mm -hmm. And the that word was actually created by a lady by the name of Ruth Engelhart. Um, 
who worked at the William Morris Agency and then handled the affairs of the show right up until her death in the early 2000s. So, wow. Wow. And they brought that back. I mean, that's kind of an inside joke almost within the show. I noticed that it's it Cal Calvada is brought up in the show various times. I mean, even, it is. even one of the guest stars that's in your documentary, I saw it's like a uh, big uh, guy. What was it? Big Tex Calvada or something like that. Big, big Max Calvada. Big yes. Max Calvada. Yeah. yeah. And, and you see it on like, you know, a door and it's 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 interesting how they tied it into the show. Yep, it was, and you're absolutely right. Inside jokes that at the time probably no one, no one probably would recognize it or ever think that some sixty years later we'd be talking about the origins of Calvada Productions, right? The entity yeah. still exists, still exists today in terms of the show's distribution and and other things like that. So, wow, that's just amazing. That really is. Yeah, you know, it's so funny because you think of Rosemary, Maury Amsterdam. You've got their background. Then you've got Sheldon Leonard's background in the movie business before he ever be became that. Then you got Danny Thomas's background, you know, before that. It's it's crazy the the amount of history that's there before we even start day one of the show. Correct. You know? Yeah. Wow. That's that's really cool. So Larry Matthews, uh, who I have uh, I I have interviewed, he was terrific, by the way. I haven't released that one yet, but um he had told a story that was really interesting about which you brought up in the memorabilia section, but his story of how he got it, it was quite amazing. Do you know that story about how he actually acquired the desk? I do. In fact, Larry and I are, are good friends and we're, we're in frequent contact with each other. So yeah. um, Larry and, and years after the Dick, Dick Van Dyke show um, worked for Danny Thomas. Um, and uh, one day he and, and another guy got a call and they said, we, we have some uh, warehouse space, but we got to clear the stuff out. We got to give up the space. So we want you to go and clear out, you know, what's in there. Yeah. And they said, you can, you know, keep, take whatever you want if you want to take anything. But he said, other than that, just throw it, throw it away. It's crazy. And as they went down there, Larry realized as he was moving things around, he looked and he said, oh my gosh, well, that that's Alan Brady's desk, right? I'm yeah. not throwing that away. And Larry took the desk, I think it was in the late seventies and mm -hmm. had it all those years um, in his home um, up until just a couple of years ago um, when yep. he was retiring and moving out of the LA area. And he called me and he said, you know, I got this desk. Do you want it? And I said, well, yeah, I'd love it, but I don't have any idea how I would ever get it back to upstate <laughs> New York where I am. Right. right. So, but I said, but I have an idea. And the idea came to fruition with Larry, um, donating the desk to the National Comedy Center in Jamestown, New York, uh, a very appropriate place uh, oh, yeah. in terms of the fact Carl Reiner was on the board of the National Comedy Center and donated all of his archives there to the Comedy Center. Rose Marie also donated a huge portion of her archives. And they, in the past year, named the Carl Reiner's archives uh, a separate area, and that's where the desk will, will be on display um, so that fans can see it at some point. So I definitely want to make it out there sometime. I've, I've had uh, different guests on that have mentioned it and it just sounds terrific. So I, it is, I, I it is a great that. place. I, I was just there uh, a few weeks ago, actually doing some additional Dick Van Dyke show research, you, looking at their archives of things. So very cool. Yeah, really yep. cool. Um, and then, you know, of course, we've got Richard Deacon, uh, you know, who I have to say, I thought personally that whenever he was in, he often stole the scene. I mean, I thought the guy was, you know, talk about, you know, kind of underrated when you're around all these comedy genius. I thought the guy was terrific. Yeah. yeah. Deacon, Deacon was, um, I think, the perfect foil to to Buddy, right, to Maury Amsterdam's Buddy. Mm -hmm. Carl wrote it. I th The relationships, uh, the tenuous relationship evolved over time. And that made it even better in certain episodes where, particularly the Walnut episode where, all of a sudden, Buddy and Mel are friends, and you know something's definitely awry then if those guys are friends, right? right? So, but yes, Deacon's deadpan, his his yuck that he would give back to Buddy, his clicker that he would have to release yep. the tension, right? And then all, also being um, the producer and subject to the ire of Alan Brady, telling him to shut up, Mel, constantly, right? But right. Deacon, Deacon, yes, was the big the big guy and sort of could take it, but at the same time. Um, could give you those expressions and and again 
the fans do appreciate uh, Deacon's uh, deadpan that that he would give and, and the exchange that he would have with Maury and the rest of the office staff. So. Oh, big big time! You know, I saw a movie recently, and I, it's so funny. Whenever I'm doing these these interviews, things just go out of my brain, and I'm like, I can't remember. Then somebody in the comments will tell me this is what the name was. But he was in a movie with um, Maury wrote it, and I believe it's it's Maury uh, Rosemary and and Deacon, and it's at like a, a diner. And Don't worry, we'll think of a title. Is the is the that's title. it? That's it. Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, I thought that was yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, and there and there, there were a lot of cameo appearances in there. I think Danny Thomas made a cameo. And, yes. You know. Yes. And um, you know, I don't know that it was uh, very successful in terms of profits, but I I think they did, Maury probably did it more for fun than any than anything else, right? And, yeah. Um, yeah, that that I think um, I think you can get that on Amazon now. For a while, you couldn't find it, but I think I think you, it's sort of available on demand if if folks are interested in trying to find it. So I believe you're right. I believe you're right. The other the other thing too is um, Maury Amsterdam. I saw him in an interview this was quite a few years ago. But you know, when you said not in it for the money, I kind of felt like Maury Amsterdam in general was not in it for the money. I mean, I was listening to him from the time that, you know, he was younger to the time, you know, through Dick Van Dyke past. I think the man just enjoyed life and he enjoyed making people laugh. I, I think you're right. But I'll tell you that others have said Maury did enjoy money. <laughs> and I'll really? tell you, because he, I'll, I'll he tell does you. not give that impression at all. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that the story that I was told by Frank Adamo. Do you, do you know Frank Adamo from the show? Ah, Frank Adamo, tell me what character, how would he well, play? Well, Frank was Dick's personal assistant. Um, he was his stand in on the show, and Frank was often in, would play bit parts. Somebody oh, wow. in the living room, uh, a delivery guy. And, and so if they needed this little bit part, Frank, Frank would play it. So, um, but Frank, being Dick's personal assistant, you know, would work with Dick when it came to be the holidays. Dick would say, well, let's order a gift for the cast and crew members yeah, and yeah. Frank would handle that, et cetera, et cetera. So um, fa fans probably are aware of the fact that Dick is quite an artist himself, does a lot of yeah. drawing. Um, so one day, um, Maury says to Dick, uh, hey, can, draw this for me. And Dick says, what? And, and so it was this little short kind of character. So Dick does the drawing. Frank tells the story a couple weeks later, back from overseas somewhere comes this little stand up doll that Maury's going to start selling. Right. And and Frank says, you know, of course, Maury's making the money selling the thing. Dick did the drawing. Dick got for the drawing. Right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of funny just to hear those behind the scenes stories of what really went on in real life. Right. Oh, um, yeah. But I, I think, you know, Maury certainly had an enormous career, but but Maury owned parking lots in New York City too to make money. Wow! Uh, you know, he had real estate and parking lots and and different things like that, as well as other ventures that he did. Um, but I I think you're right. Mor Maury would say to me, um, "I'm the happiest fella I ever met." Right? Yeah. And and I think that that's true. I think that added to not only his longevity but the longevity of these casts. When when you look at the cast. The longevity of most of these folks involved with the show was extraordinary. You know, mm -hmm. Joe Leonard, 89 when he passed and, and Maury Amsterdam, 87 and Carl Reiner, 98, Rose Marie, 94, Dick Van Dyke still going at 98 and a half. Right. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And I think laughter and being able to laugh at life um, and mm -hmm. find some humor in it. Um, you know, Maury wrote the little the little parody song start off each day with a joke and everything will be okie doke right wow uh, it's corny in a way but it sort of sums up a, a philosophy that i think many of them live by um and oh, that, yeah that that gave them long fruitful lives so i would i would agree with you did um rosemary by the way where was she at uh actually when when this uh when the dick van dyke show came around where was she at in her career she had been forming up and working on the Bob Cummings show with Ambie Davis. Hmm. Um, and Danny, she was good friends with Danny Thomas. Um, and she kept saying to him, you know, when am I going to do your show? And he said, you, you know, it'll come, it'll come, it'll come. Finally, she got a call from Desi Lou. And 
they said that, you know, they want you to come over. And she said, oh, finally, the Danny Thomas show. And they said, well, no. And she said, well, what are you talking about? They said, she said, it's for the Dick Van Dyke show. And Rosemary said, you know, famously, what what's a Dick Van Dyke? Right. <laughs> right, right he was right. an unknown quantity at that point. Right. Right. So o- over she went um, and really at the recommendation of Sheldon Leonard, um, who is quoted as saying, you know, if you want the basket, get Rosemary. She wow. was, like I said, this, the second cast member um, signed for, for the show after after Dick and then Maury and, and the, the chain reaction of, of the rest. So, um, but you're right. You know, you talk about her career. She was Baby Rosemary on the radio and then she mm-hmm. was in Vaudeville, right? And in the 1940s, she returned as, as a young lady and headlined with Jimmy Durante and right. Xavier Cougat in the first opening of the Las Vegas uh, nightclubs out there working for Bugsy Siegel. Wow. Uh, and uh, there's a great documentary on her life, if fans are not aware of it, called Wait for Your Laugh, um, yes. which is uh, a tremendous tribute to her her life, her career, um, and sort of her sad love story of her of she and her husband and his passing so early um, in his life from sort of an unknown, unknown blood disease. Um, but it's a, a very well done film that it gives gives a whole different perspective to uh, fans, much bigger and broader than than Sally Rogers for sure. So was that was it in your documentary or I had, had I seen that somewhere else um, where she does something that it, that has always been like a dedication to her husband on the show. It's like it, it's either what she wears or a motion. I I'm trying to remember. Yes, it's her hair bow. So she always wore a hair bow. Um, when her husband passed, um, she still continued to wear the hair bow, but previous to that, she would wear a pink hair bow, a blue hair bow. Mm-hmm. Once her husband passed, she always stayed with a black hair bow from the time that he passed on for the, for the rest of her career. So, wow. uh, and that was sort of a secret, um, until the, the documentary and they interviewed Peter Marshall and he knew the secret and, and revealed it. I say unknowingly, but I think maybe Peter thought it was time for the secret to be revealed. So uh, out of out of his mouth came the, the secret about the bow. So. How interesting. Really interesting. I liked, you know, there were there were some other moments, too, that I enjoyed in the documentary that, um, you know, you interviewed a lot of uh, the like sons, daughters of the cast or writers, because obviously they they aren't here anymore. But um, I, I mean, the, the stars aren't here anymore. They are the writer. But uh, one was with uh, Gary Marshall's wife. I really enjoyed that one. Um, I, I, I not just I mean I I had met Gary and and uh, so I had I had my own personal experience with him and that was great and and all that. But it was more what she said that was so uh, interesting. She spoke about the the cans and the um, oh my god I can't believe I blanked out. Oh the um, the bathtub the uh, the uh he's st- toe in the getting, spout. Toe, yeah. yeah exactly toe her mary's toe gets stuck in the in the spot what uh yeah why, why don't you t- why don't you tell them a little bit about that because i thought well, that was pretty fun this this speaks to what we mentioned you know uh, a few minutes ago of being real life stories right so mm-hmm. gary would go home and say you know what did you do today or i'm going to be out late and and, and she said, well, what do you mean? You're going to be out late. I'm a little nervous being home alone. And he said, well, you'll be all right. And so she t- she talked to somebody else and they said, well, why don't you put like empty metal cans by the back door? If someone comes in, it'll be like an alarm. Because she said, we didn't have an alarm back in those days. right? <laughs> so Gary happened to come home. And sure enough, Gary opened the door and knocked all the cans over and said, you know, what's going on here? And she explained. And she said, wasn't but a few weeks later, all of a sudden that scene showed up in one of the things. And she said, you know, if you're going to keep stealing my ideas, you're going to have to pay me for them. Right. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. But um, yeah, yeah, Barbara shared some unique insights into, I think, um, Jerry's contributions to the show. I also think uh, it was interesting to hear her discuss really how the young guys like Gary and others were really mentored by some of the longer tenure folks like Carl and others um, to try to foster and and bolster their careers. And and ultimately, you know, I think Gary had a a lot of his success probably attributable back to the 
Van Dyke Show days and being involved with Carl and the connections that you made and the experience that that you gained, right? So, um, oh, yeah. And and Gary wrote some. Gary and Jerry Belson wrote some great episodes of of the Van Dyke Show. Um, you know, there are probably a handful of episodes that um, fans will talk about and say, "Well, I don't really like this because of that." Or, but you know, o- overall. Um, the episodes really still hold up. And again, I think they hold up because Carl is very careful to not get uh, slang or events of the day. And occasionally it crept in, but very, very minimally. Right. Um, But, but to have situations, you you know, that a husband and wife could still relate to, even though it's 2024, a a wife opening her husband's mail or vice versa. Yeah. Um, You know, trouble with kids at school and dealing with the teacher and um, you know, things that still are life relatable events and make them relevant. Um, as you watch the episodes, I, I hop on the treadmill every morning, throw on an episode of the Van Dyke show and I'll go downstairs to, to get my coffee when I'm done. And my wife will say, what, what were you laughing at? I said, yeah. well, I was watching the Van Dyke show. She goes, well, what, how many times have you seen it? I said, honey, it's still funny. Even though I know what's coming, it's yeah. still funny. Right. It's that look that Laura gives Rob or vice versa or or Mel doing a yuck at Buddy or a yep. shut up Mel from Alan or or whatever. But some of the subtle uh, delivery of lines and looks just all still hold up all these years later. I would I would agree with you that that scene, by the way, with the bathtub, with the um, where uh, Mary Tyler Moore has her, you know, what is, is it her big toe? I can't remember. Yes. Yeah, her big toe. I got to tell you, I, I think it's a great episode. And I remember that episode. But I looking back, I also think as an actress to put yourself in that, you know, in that uh, situation, I'm sorry, but that actually would have been hard to do. And and Mary was not happy with that episode. And I'll tell you why. She had been told by Carl that a great episode was coming that was going to feature her. Yeah. And it finally came. And then... Um, Two, two things collided, which was that week, Mary decided to quit smoking. So she was having some issues with that. But then as the scene played out, Mary realized that she wasn't on camera. Right. And she said, Carl, you know, I, no one's seeing me. And he said, oh, Mary, you have something much better than that. And she, he, she said, huh? And he said, you have all of America imagining or wondering in their minds how Laura Petrie's looking in this bathtub right and and it you know didn't didn't go well and they did have a a clash and mary sort of stormed off the set and carl sort of yelled at her on the set and that that night they they made up and and carl said you know i apologize i should have never yelled at you there but he said try to trust me and i think that in the end you'll see that really this is quite quite a premise and the episode will be well received which of course it was and is one of the favorites of, of fans, you know, fans can quote various lines from that episode. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Bill Idelson, who was Herman Glimshire in that episode, played like the the bellboy or the, or, excuse me, the house detective, right? And Rob trying to, you know, get saucy with his wife paints on a mustache and, you know, Idelson comes in, he looks at him and he can't figure out what's going on or what's different. All of a sudden he says, ah, you painted it on. Oh, that's not, I'm not crazy. You painted it on, right? And and fans <laughs> know know the lines, know the scenes, know who delivered it. It's it's quite a core of of groups of of passionate fans for this Dick Van Dyke show. Oh yeah, big time, big time. The other one that I like that I mean I have to admit I was glad to see a couple in the in the your documentary that I personally like. One of them is, um, and I don't know the titles as well. The ghosts, the one where they're um, they're all together, and it, you know it's. Basically, there's ghosts there. Yes. The, um, now, in that episode, am I right about this? That the guy that uh, I think his name is Richard C. I think it goes by Richard C. Carmel or whatever. He was the um, oh god, he played. I think he's the face of like the ghost or whatever. He's like um, you know uh, brought in as like a, a hallucination or a, a hologram. Yeah. yeah, I think the actor you're talking about was actually Roger Carmel and Roger it, Carmel. That's right? it. But, but yeah. that was not Roger Carmel in this episode. It was a, it was a different gentleman. No kidding. Um, was Roger it, Carmel in Van Dyke he, or not? He, he was in a later episode where uh, 
Rob and Buddy and Sally all feel that they're entitled to a raise, and Rob goes up to the accountant's office, played by Carmel, and and gets the you know a uh, hundred thousand dollar explanation why you know Rob could get a raise because he's paid by this corporation, but Buddy and Sally can't because they're paid by a different corporation. Ishimoro and these funny names that they all made up, right? Right, right. I remember yes. that episode, yes. actually, that you're talking about. Interesting. So, Roger was in that that episode, but the I, the name eludes me. I know the name of the of the guy who was the the ghost, and I can't think of it now, right off the top. Of my yeah, head. I think I I think I brought those two together. But Rod, Roger, I think, also then goes on to Star Trek and becomes the. Uh, Oh my gosh, I can't believe yeah. I can't think of it. But he was very famous in that his episode too, where he plays like a a guy that uh, you know I don't know that he's just he's a real con man basically. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. But I can't think of it. Very interesting. Um. So we've got uh, Jerry Paris obviously as well. That um. You know I you know very, everybody always says he was the greatest director. He was phenomenal. I mean I've had all the Happy Days guys on. They all say you know just how incredible Jerry Paris was. But um, what what have you learned about Jerry Paris, how he got involved? And in, because obviously he plays the role on the show as well. But, you know, right. Yeah. So, yeah, Jerry, you know, um, it, again, the, the Hollywood community back then, I think, was pretty small. There was yeah. a, a quite quite a network. Um, so, you know, Jerry got involved early on for the role of of Jerry Helper, the dentist. Right. And actually recommended and morgan gilbert for the part of millie oh really uh, yes and these these families in real life all lived in sort of the same community or, or same neighborhood um and, in huh. fact you know i never got to meet jerry i started my publication after jerry had passed but um i have since met all three of jerry's children and i'm good friends with with all of them and on one of my first trips to L.A., I was sitting in the living room of Julie Paris, Jerry's daughter, um, and talking about the show. And and she was very gracious, showed me her dad's Emmy Awards, his Directors Guild Awards, the scripts that he had on the shelf, shared wow. photographs and all sorts of things. Um, but I said to her, you know, um, maybe you could help me try to locate some other people from the show. And she said, well, who, who do you mean? And I said, well you know, Bill Idelson, who played Herman Glimpshire. And she sort of looked at me and she said, well, you want to meet him? I said, well, yeah, well, why? She said, well, hold on a minute. So she gets up and goes across the room, picks up the phone, dials the number. And she says, Billy, I got this guy here from New York who loves the Dick Van Dyke show. Can we come down for a visit? Okay, we'll be right down. She hangs at the phone. I said, where are we going? She said, oh, Bill is about, you know, six or eight houses down the road. Let's, we're going down to his house. Wow. So away we went, right? So- this network of uh, actors and directors and things, again, a very, very tight, tight community. Um, Jerry originally kept after Carl Reiner saying, I want to direct, I want to direct, I want to direct. And Carl's like, oh, well, let's let's figure it out. Finally, he gave um, Jerry the opportunity. Um, and once Jerry started to direct, then all the cast wanted was Jerry to direct the episodes. Um, yeah. They wanted him, right? Um, they had had John Rich in the earlier season, um, and, and Sheldon Leonard had done a few. And every once in a while, there would be another director. But Jerry be became the guy and then, you know, directed the, the majority of the shows from about middle of season two out. Um, and uh, they they loved him, right? The other thing they the cast would tell you about Jerry Paris was he was the friendliest guy. But they said his mouth had no filter. Whatever Jerry was thinking, right out of the mouth it would come. And things wow. would come out and people would say, what did you say, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, his daughter Julie shared with me, uh, she said, you know, David, I wish wish my dad were still alive to meet you because um, if he were here, um, he, he would have organized a, a backyard barbecue and we would have had a big barbecue and gone swimming in the pool because she said, that's just the way my dad was. He was just a real down to earth, friendly guy, right? Um, oh. And you know, she said we we go to the beach and we meet people at the beach, and the next thing you know, the, those would be friends and they'd be back at the house, and and you know, that we'd be having enjoying time time with them. So, um, so the the Paris kids continue the the tradition, um, 
and uh, are doing doing well out there in in LA. So, That's great. That's really yeah. great. Yeah. The um and then what in regards to Sheldon Leonard, uh, what it what had you heard about his past? You know, prior to the show, or you know, any stories, anything that came up of, regarding him. Well, I have a I have a good Sheldon Leonard story. As I began my publication, as you mentioned, the Walnut Times back in the mid nineties, I basically, you know, would call the Screen Actors Guild and say, can, can you give me so-and-so's agent, whatever. Mm -hmm. Went to the library and looked up in celebrity address books, the addresses of folks from, from the show, right? Yeah. It, was, it was pretty, um, pretty old school back in the mid nineties. Yeah. Um, so I found an address for Sheldon Leonard and I sent him a letter and I said, here's what I'm doing. Would you, um, you know, do an interview with me? Um, and I didn't hear anything and I didn't hear anything. And one, um, one Saturday morning, um, we were up and about and the phone rang and my wife was down the hall and I was in the bedroom and the, it rang once and stopped. And I said, did you answer that? And my wife said, no. And I said, well, what happened? Who answered it? And I look out across the thing into the kitchen. There's my five-year-old son with the phone in his hand. <laughs> so I'm like, well, so I go over and I pick up the phone and, and you know, I said, hello. And he says, David, this is Sheldon Leonard. I'm like, oh my gosh, my five-year-old son answered the phone, right? <laughs> so he says, you you, you want to do an interview? He says, call me back next Saturday, nine o'clock. See you then. And and that was, uh, I came to find out later, that was sort of the Sheldon Leonard mantra. Wow. Um, Sheldon was doing Dick Van Dyke, Andy Griffith, uh, you know, all these shows on the Disney Luke will Plank a lot, all at the same time. Yeah. So he would sort of move from show to show and they would have a table read and Sheldon wouldn't be there at the start. And all of a sudden they'd look up and there would Sheldon be in the shadows. He'd snuck in and was sitting there and he'd give his comments and they turn and they talk about something. They turn to ask him something and he, he, he was going on to the next show. Right. Wow. So um, so Sheldon's presence was definitely um, noted on that on that lot. Um, and I think the impact that he had in terms of situation comedies back then he's probably attributed um creating the spinoff because that's how he created the andy griffith show from doing a andy a, a little scene on danny thomas yeah um, but um sheldon was um was quite a guy and so that following week i called the house to to do the interview and the, the phone got answered by uh, you know, a housekeeper. And she said, well, Mr. Leonard is not here. And I said, well, I was supposed to interview him. And she said, well, maybe he'll be here in a bit. And half hour later, the phone rang and it was Sheldon apologizing that he was late. But he said, I had been out doing errands in Beverly Hills, realizing I had the interview. I jumped in the car and I was speeding home and I got stopped by the Beverly Hills police and was given a speeding ticket on my way back to oh, your geez. interview. So uh, a great, a great little sidebar to, uh, understanding how the whole thing you know came to be yeah that's uh, pretty cool but I was, uh, oh go ahead please. i was gonna say sheldon um i asked him you know i said sheldon you'd have been a producer a director a writer you know all these things he said what's your favorite favorite thing that you've done and he said whatever i'm doing at the moment and getting paid for david is what's my favorite <laughs> wow 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 i could totally see it yeah yep. Would it, yeah yeah he, he feels like that kind of guy. The um the other aspect of uh, that I was intrigued by in the documentary is how many of the kids of either like the Van Dykes or you know writers or you know whomever were in the in the show. Like you know they, there were many episodes actually where there were kids running around whatever, and I was so surprised. It it sounded it sounds like that was a very common part of the show. Yeah, at least on the Van Dyke show, that's true, right? A uh, couple of the Paris kids were in episodes. Dick's two sons were in episodes. Assistant director John Choulet's daughter Cornell was in several episodes. Um, and I think if they needed a scene with kids, they'd say to the folks, you know, should we have your are your kids available next Tuesday or whatever for the the filming? And in the kids would come. Um, I, I think you know I appreciate you, you you mentioning the kids in the documentary because. Um, I think what's interesting is for me as a fan of the show, you know, I was born in 60. So mm -hmm. I probably am not remembering like the first run of the show because I was sure. way too little, right? But it, it was syndicated and, and I probably picked it up there and then watched it through the years. It was everywhere. Uh, but, yeah. but 
the Van Dyke Show continues to appeal to new generations of folks, right? Um, and I thought it was particularly uh, intriguing and interesting to hear the perspectives of a Chris Van Dyke, Dick's son, um, talking about what life was like just before the Van Dyke Show, right? And then yeah. suddenly the Van Dyke Show and our lives changed, right? Um, to hear uh, Nora uh, Eckstein talk about her mom's role as, as Millie on the show, um, to hear Lucas Reiner recall what it was like when he was growing up and he said, you know, remembering his dad upstairs in his office, typing away, working working on the show. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, you know, Rosemarie's daughter offered her perspective on things. Greg Amsterdam, Maury's son, offered his perspective. Um, they were there, right? They were right. on the set. They observed the dynamics of what went on. Sometimes they were in an episode, but more often than not, they were at least sitting in the bleachers, right? Watching the episodes be filmed um, and had all those memories that they could share. I so, thought it was interesting that to hear from me, and it might've been Chris Van Dyke, that when he was, uh, as you said, before the Van Dyke show, so to speak. And it, it's interesting because I kind of got the feeling like there was that bit of struggle or whatever. And then suddenly it's like, oh, wow, we've got, you know, yeah, certain things yeah. now people kind of notice me or know, you know, it's really interesting to, to hear that because I think everybody just assumes, oh, Dick Van Dyke. I mean, everybody knew Dick Van Dyke and it wasn't that way. No, no. In fact, you know, he reminisced they were backstage, you know, hanging in the wings of Bye Bye Birdie, sort of watching their dad. Right. And then, oh, we heard he's going to go to California and do this pilot. Right. OK. You know, that he, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden, ba boom, you know, that that was in uh you know, the early part of, of 61 when they did the pilot mm -hmm. and then the show didn't actually, you know, come on the air until October of that year. So um, a lot of, a lot of things happened in those nine months or so in between that changed their lives, you know, for forever. For yeah. Sure. It's, it's very, another aspect of the kids is I li listening to all these different interviews, you're like, and most of them didn't go into show business. Yep. Most of them were like, you know, I don't even want to go there. One thing I did like about what Chris Van Dyke said is he said um, to try and follow in the shadow of my father and not even have close to any of the talent of him. Just I recognize why would I bother doing that? Yes, I, I thought that I, was great. Yes, I love it. Yes, yeah, a great observation. And and the honesty to share that with all of us. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I realized. Yeah. There was no way I, I, I had no talent, right? Yeah, I love that. And there was somebody else that was on the sh on there that I, I I love moments like this. Her, she had one line, I think, in one episode, and she says, uh, and it might, might have been the the um, daughter of uh, you, you said one of the writers or the assistant director Chule, yeah. where she says um, lawyers in there, and she, now she's a little kid. She's like, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna guess maybe five, I don't know, six. And yeah. then she goes on and becomes a lawyer in real life. Right. I love it. Which, which at the time she said, I didn't even know what a lawyer was. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. So there were some other, you know, at the time, not necessarily famous guest stars, but they, they are now. Um, one, Barry Livingston, who I've, I've had on the show and I, I gotten to know Barry a little bit as well. Um, a little side note, we actually were in a, I, I have an acting background, by the way, he, Barry and I were actually in a commercial together for cool. like Honda. Yeah. Before we really like knew each other, but, but he, um, he mentioned the, um, the tiger pajamas, uh, right. episode. Yep. And it's interesting because you see him and you go, oh my gosh, there is uh, Ernie from, uh, my three sons like that. He, he has it even then. Yes. You know? Yep. Yep. And the fact that he said, you know, there's these pajamas, which we didn't see in all rehearsal, right? They were revealed to us on show night. And of course, what did they think what was going to happen? But all of us kids just laughed because they <laughs> would look at these pajamas, right? And then we got sort of scolded like, you can't laugh, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I love that. Um, but yes, the great, great, great memories of, of those times. Um, you, you know, sadly, you know, as we said, we're 60 some years past, right? Right. There's, there's just a core handful of folks that are still left from from the show um but um it's it's still nice that that those folks are around and many of them in their 90s you know you know barry as a kid of course is a little younger but some of the other guest stars on the show are, oh. are getting up there in age for sure yeah big time well jamie Farr, i know was, was on there and i i've wanted to get jamie on my show and 
it's still a possibility. He hasn't completely said no, but he just doesn't do very many. And uh, uh -huh. and he's at an you know he's at an older age. I I respect that. Um, but what, you know, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you this. Um, I was told when I was trying to get Jamie for my special, right? Yeah. He he doesn't do very many, right? So don't don't be discouraged if he declines, right? But when he heard it was the Van Dyke show, he yeah. was in. And again, it was because it was the Van Dyke show, right? Yeah. Um, and his fond memories of how he was treated and how he was able to contribute so early in his career, uh, even in the small role that he had as the snappy delivery coffee guy, right? Yeah, but so, he had a great, I mean, come on, snappy, <laughs> snappy service. It's uh -huh. like just a good, it's a great line. And and he stand, he's another one. You, you, you can sense... Uh, a star quality, a, a, a special quality. He walks in, you notice him. Yep, yep. And I think his best line was uh, when he's there in the office having delivered coffee and Laura's been hired for the week to dance and she comes in with this black leotard on and he says, va 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 boom, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and Rob says, get out, get out of here, you know, <laughs> you, you jerk, sort of. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But he delivers it so well, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and the, the other one is uh, Bernie Coppell. Uh, I'll be honest, until I saw the documentary, I was like, you know what? I don't think I had remembered that he he had been on there. But, um, you know, obviously he goes on and he has massive success in Love Boat and, you know, I, other other aspects of his career. But yep. um, that's pretty cool that he was he was part of that, too. That sounded to me, at least in the way he delivers in the documentary, like Carl Reiner, not that he isn't very talented as an actor, but I felt like that was another instance where Carl Reiner was like, I want to give him a, you know, give him a little help. Let's yeah. let's get him on. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that Desi Luke Kawanga, if you could flash back in time mm -hmm. and, and be a fly on the wall, it would be, have been really interesting to be on that lot with all the production going on, right? Um, and, and you see the character actors that went from show to show to show. You know, they would be on Andy Griffith this week and Two weeks later, they'd make an appearance on Van Dyke and then they'd be on maybe a Danny Thomas, right? And I think back in the day, it was a much different environment in terms of auditioning and yep. going after roles. I think they say, oh, you know, we need Herbie Faye. Is he, is he available this week? We'll call, call him and see if he'll do the show. It wasn't, will you come and audition? It was, will you come and do the show, right? Right. And, and that network and that that core of things and and... You know, they had on the on the lot there Hal's Studio Cafe, um, huh. where um, it was a unique cafe because um, it was where the stars went and ate their lunch. But that was the inside of the lot. But there was an outside entrance to the public into Hal's Studio Cafe. So the public could go in and sit down and have their lunch and look across and see, well, there's Andy Griffith or there's Dick Van Dyke or there's or wherever. Right. Oh, is that cool? Um, and, um, you, you know, we've stumbled upon old menus from Hal Studio Cafe of that era. And the sandwiches were named, there's the, the Dick Van Dyke sandwich, and there was the, the Andy Griffith sandwich. And um, uh, who played, help, help me here, who played Gomez? His name is... Um, uh, oh, um, uh, J J John Aston. John Aston. There's a John Aston sandwich, because that was the time of Dickinson Fenster was, was on the lot, yeah, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, again, a, another little tie in that makes um, some of that trivia uh, a bit more fun to, to talk about. So that's really interesting. You know, I'll tell you a little I, I don't even know if I've ever said this before in one of my interviews, but I actually worked on that lot in the 90s uh, oh. in the early 90s. I was actually I actually worked on it when it was just uh, I think they had gotten rid of the Desi Lu name at that point. But but it was still the Coenga, the Coenga lot. And uh -huh. uh, it's just so funny to hear you talk about it because it was very, it was a very small lot and it's very close self-contained. Whereas, you know, Warner brothers or something like that, it's these massive, you know, uh, areas. And I, so I can, I can really appreciate what you're saying. I mean, it would have been very easy to, you know, be able to spot somebody just across the alley. I mean, Barry, uh, Barry brought up a great story that when he was there, um, you know, Lucy, Lucy, uh, Lucy uh, would be coming down in a golf cart, you yeah. know, buzzing around on the golf cart, tiny, tiny area. So then you add that studio cafe. <clears throat> uh, believe me, I would have been, I would have been there in two seconds eating there yeah. just to oh, yeah. with them. That's pretty cool. 
So Seinfeld was actually filmed on the same soundstage as the Dick Van Dyke show. Wow. Um, and in more recent years, there was a Mad About You reboot done a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and they were trying to find space to shoot that and struggling. They ended up at, I think it's called Red Studios today. Interesting. Um, and they secured the space and... Uh, a, a friend of mine, a, a television producer, Peter Tolan, had been hired to to oversee the Mad About You reboot. Um, so he went to check out the space. And mm -hmm. while he was there, Peter's also a huge Dick Van Dyke show fan and a fan of Carl Reiner's writing and whatever. Yeah, very uh, successful, uh, Peter Tolan. By, very. Yes, by Carl, Carl's writing. And all of a sudden it came to light that they were shooting the Mad About reboot on the same soundstage as the Van Dyke show. Wow. And Peter said, I'm, I'm not going to lie, Dave, I, I wandered around the catacombs, if you will, looking oh, yeah. to see, were there any markings from 50, 60 yeah, years? Yeah, I get you know, it. I um, get it. To see what history might still be alive there on, on that soundstage, right? Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Believe me, I, I would have done the exact same uh, as as him. The, I've, um, driven, the other... I've driven by that times when I've been in L.A. I've never had the, the guts to push my way in and say, can, can I please see stage or whatever it was, stage eight? Oh, yeah. I I think I was on that stage. I, I just don't think I realized that it was the Van Dyke stage at the time because I was around all of those at, at uh -huh. the time. Um, the uh, And the other aspect of your, your documentary, you talk about uh, different memorabilia. I thought that was actually really cool. Um, I, I know as a fan of classic television, I love seeing like some of those, you know, little things that were either given out or what was happening. Was that all from... Um, the you know the the kids showing you what they still had because it felt like a lot of the memorabilia was basically still in the families of people from the Van Dyke show. I think those that still have it, um, it's well treasured, right? They they yeah. they are holding on to it. Every once in a while, though, on eBay, you'll you'll see an, a stray item, whether it's someone who acquired it along through the years now and is is dispensing the the collection. But m many of what you see are cast gifts that. Dick had created for the cast. So Dick did a drawing of um, of the cast. Yeah, I don't know how well you can see sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, we can right. see it actually clear as day. So Dick, Dick did that drawing and then back in the day, put it on playing cards as a gift for the cast around the holidays. They made a, a an ashtray. Of course, everybody back in those days smoked, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, one time for the men, Dick did a drawing of himself and put it on cufflinks. I but, saw that those were, those stood out. I mean, not that I wear cufflinks, but I thought yeah. they were so cool. Yeah, I um that actually I have a pair of the cufflinks that were a gift to me from the family of Bud Mullen, who was wow. the film editor on I Love Lucy and the Dick Van Dyke Show, and good friends with Carl Reiner and edited Carl's films and things. That's and cool. When Bud, when Bud passed, his wife sent me a package and she said, "I think Bud would like you to have these for your friendship together." So, oh, that uh, must have choked you up. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, probably the the awakening moment for, for me is I've been publishing the newsletter from 95 into the early 2000s. And Carl decided he was going to do the Dick Van Dyke show revisited, right? A reunion show, which he had yeah. always resisted to do. But in 2004, he, he decided to do it. So um, I don't know if I called Carl or he called me, but I said, Carl, can I come? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, can I come to the filming? And he said, well, can you be a fly on the wall? And I said, I can be whatever you want me to be, right? <laughs> Ain't no kidding. So um, they originally were going to have a studio audience, but in the end, they decided um, to just fil film it. And, and in fact, they did have an audience, but the audience consisted of other family members or close friends or, or mm. whatever, um, of which I was then part of because I had been invited by Carl to be there. That's cool. Um, and that was sort of um, at the point that I realized that I wasn't sort of this fan of the show and sort of on the outside of the circle, but I had sort of been folded into the Dick Van Dyke show family. That's cool. Um, and that was um, quite quite a moment for me as, as a fan of the show to, um, I guess, you know, at, at that point I had established friendships with Carl and Dick and Rosemary and, and the Paris kids and, and so many others. So on the set, I was a known commodity to, to all the, the people that were there. Oh, that, that must have made you feel like a million oh, bucks. Absolutely. Right. And and I said, you know, 
if anything I could have wished for was that I was alive back in the 60s to have gone for a filming, but I got the second best thing and that was to be there for the filming of the reunion show, right? So I love that. I um, totally uh, love that. It was, um, but that was the, all of a sudden it sort of hit me, you know, Dave, you're, you're not an outsider anymore. You're, you're part of the family. And in fact, um, after the documentary was done, Bill Persky, you know, one of the writers um, sent me a very nice note and said, you know, I just finished watching the documentary for about the third time. I'm sure I'll watch it many more times. Right. Yeah. But he said, you know, thank you for doing this. And if I've never said it before, he said, I want you to know that we certainly consider you a member of the Dick Van Dyke show family. Again, some, some further validation of uh, my, my passion for, for Carl's show. So, That's really seriously cool. I love, I yeah. love hearing that. I love that they brought you in, you know, they, they brought you into the fold, so to speak. Yeah. Did, you, did you get to know Mary Tyler Moore at all? I did some, but I'll tell you of all the cast, Mary was probably the most private. Mm -hmm. um, I pursued her to get an interview for uh, a number of years um, she finally consented when she was doing, um, reunion show with Valerie Harper, Mary and Rhoda. Yeah. Uh, and we had a nice, very nice conversation. And, um, but through the years, she, she sort of was just more private. Um, yeah. um, I will say in the last, uh, year of her life, um, I was out buying a birthday card for someone else one day and I saw a card with a kitten on it and it reminded me of the her little meow or her MGM or yeah. MGM at the end of her show. Right. Right. And I just wrote her a note and said, uh, I saw this card and I thought of you today and how much we appreciate your body of work. Of course, I liked Laura Petrie the best or whatever. And I, of course. I sent the card. Um, and a couple of weeks after I got a phone call from her husband um, and he said, I wanted to let you know, um, Mary got your card and really appreciated it. And, and I want to thank you for, for remembering her and thinking of her. And it was just, Two or three months later that sh that she passed right so hmm. um but um i think further validation of of my commitment um and integrity was her husband robert levine uh normally you know wouldn't wasn't too much involved in things but yeah i approached him about being in the documentary and and he offered some tremendous insights into yeah. things and i think i think part of it was for so many years he sat in the room as a bystander hearing Mary tell the stories that yeah. he just learned them. Right. And he could tell them like it was her. And it was, it was pretty staggering and, and uh, pretty interesting to hear him tell these stories um, with such detail and, and remembrance. So. Yeah, that's a true love affair. Those two. I saw the Mary Tyler Moore, uh, the recent doc that they put out and it was, it was excellent. It was yes. excellent. Yeah. Yep. Really enjoyed that. I couldn't, I couldn't shut that off. Um, well, listen, that was great. I mean, I got to say, I, I love the breakdown of the show. I love, you know, your documentary. So if, if anyone's looking for it, uh, David, where should they where should they go to see your documentary? If, if folks go out to YouTube and just Google Dick Van Dyke Show 60th anniversary, it should pop right up. Um, I'm pleased we've had uh, we're we're getting close to 200,000 views. So that's uh, very, very rewarding to know that other other fans are doing it. Um, Definitely and, that is and enjoying it. Um, so, but by all means, share it and with, with other fans, um, if folks would like to also participate, I have a Facebook group called Wait. celebrating the Dick Van Dyke show. Uh, we have about 7,000 members there and we share behind the scenes tidbits and rare photographs and talk about our favorite episodes on, on things. So, um, that's, that's a place that, uh, folks can, can chime in as individuals is it just and, the Dick Van Dyke group or what is it? What is your title to the Facebook group? Yeah. Celebrating the Dick Van Dyke show. Okay. Yep. And it's, it's every once in a while, we stray outside the boundaries a little bit when we'll get a photo of Dick in this bird and Mary Poppins. Or whatever. Then we tr try to try to bring it back in to, to keep it about the topic at hand. Right. Yeah. Um, um, but the next thing that I, that I can share if your fans are interested is sure. um, we talked about, um, various generations enjoying the show um i was approached by uh, a young lady her name is abby Ryder, who's about 40 years old a huge fan of the show and she and i are collaborating uh, on a new podcast that we're calling tripping over the ottoman um and the debut episode yeah, yeah the, the debut episode will come out um 
in early June. And that's actually, um, we're going to host that on, on YouTube as well on the Tripping Over the Ottoman channel that we've created. Very um, nice. But we're going to um, sort of deep dive into various episodes of, of the show that are our favorites. We fortunately, uh, through my collecting of archival material over the years, sometimes have first generation drafts of scripts. And we'll talk about how the script evolved over time. We'll talk about the character uh, bit players that are in there and maybe what other things they did. Some bits of trivia, like we talked about the genesis of Calvada Productions, that'll likely come up. Yeah, um, I like it. I like it. I think it'd be uh, great. It's it's, it's a, sort of an informal fan discussion, and and you know we're looking for uh, feedback from others about about what they think about it. So we're, we're having a good time. We we have uh, two episodes completed, and we're scheduled to do our third. Mm -hmm. uh, the first episode, I'll give you the I'll give you the the lowdown. Is our first episode is about. Sure. The Great Petri Fortune is the first episode that we talk about. Uh, one one of our favorites, Old Uncle Hezekiah and his roll top desk. So, oh my gosh, that, yeah, vaguely I'm like going. I think I I think I remember. There were so many yeah. episodes. I can't. Yeah. I'm not as good as you are at that. That sounds great though. I'm I'm happy to hear that. I think that I think that's wonderful. I will definitely check it out. Yeah, very good. Sure. Very good. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's been a pleasure, John. Yeah, I um I'm gonna go back and um. I'm so happy that, you know, our paths have crossed. I'm going to go back and certainly take a look at much more of the content that you have available because it looks like you have a, a great library of things that I will also enjoy. So I think you will. I think you will. It's definitely a, it's definitely a passion for me, too. So I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, and I'll tell you one other thing. When did you sure. talk to Larry Matthews recently or not recently? Talk to him about uh, probably. I'm going to say within the last two months or so. I mean, time okay. goes by, but I think it's been within the last two months. I just have been so busy releasing that I haven't had a chance to release his yet. Yeah. So um, an event coming up out your way, it's on September 8th, which is, a you, you, I think this is right up your alley. So, Oh, I know. I know what you're going to say, because I think night, I'm going to be the, I may be the guy doing the, uh, the Q&A with them. But go ah, on. The night of, night of Dreams event. Yes, yes. Caroline. September 8th. Um, if if you're there, we'll, we'll meet in person because I plan to be there as well. I'm planning on it. So I think we will be meeting each other. But please, you can you can go ahead, please, because Caroline, I think the world of uh, let people know. I'd like. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. September 8th at the Indian Wells Hotel Resort in uh, Indian Wells, which is the hotel that Lucy and Desi started. Uh, there's a night night of dreams event called meeting the Desi Lou kids. So Larry Matthews will be there, uh, John Provost, Stan Livingston, and um, Keith Thibodeau from, from I Love Lucy. Um, and it's a very small sort of intimate gathering where you get to fraternize with, with the guys, have some dinner, have some cocktails, have some good food, um, ask them some questions. I think there's an opportunity maybe for a photo op, but sort of a very low-key, laid-back, intimate affair out there. To hear them tell the stories of what it was like to be a Desi Lou kid on, on that lot and, and doing their shows. It, I think it's going to be a great night of, of fun and reminiscing. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, making another trip to L.A. here from the East Coast to, to be part of that. So Yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be really good. I think it's really good. Carolyn and I just connected very recently. And uh, so we're, we're working uh, we're working to see how we can make that uh happen for you know both of us but i think that's probably what's going to happen is I'll, yeah. I'll probably do the q a while, uh for that event but excellent um, but anyway yeah i'm glad you brought that up any way we any way to pitch uh her her thing i'm always happy so um great david thanks a bunch for being on i really really appreciate it and uh My pleasure. thanks for having me it's it's always it's always great fun just it, it's clear too you have a, a love for the show and know a lot about it it's always share Nice to share that passion with other fans. Oh, or like definitely. Other, other wall nuts of the show. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, exactly. We, we still have our, well, we have our sense of humor, I guess. Our <laughs> love <to> become, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you so much. I appreciate you. All right. Be good. You too. As always, thanks for listening, and please hit the subscription button and the notification bell so that you can be notified when I have a new episode. And also, go check out uh, some of my other episodes, like Jerry Mathers, Henry Winkler, Judy Norton, so many. Enjoy.